We're here this afternoon for the uh, session called Lean Green Past, Lean Green Future. My name is Steve Devin. I'm an Associate Professor of Economics at St. Mary's University and Director of the Southern Research Institute. Uh, I'm uh, going to be the moderator for the panel this morning. Uh, we have with us um, Steve Tillerson and Jeff Crane who are going to give the presentations uh, here in a little bit. I'm going to talk for a few minutes and uh, sort of set things up um, and I'll, I'll turn it over to these fine gentlemen and then um, we'll uh, take some questions. They're going to talk for about 15-20 minutes and then we'll have some questions and you can come to the mic up here and, and uh, pepper all of us with questions if you wish. Now part of it is, as I'm sure you've seen in the, the program, the, the purpose of the session is to explore San Antonio's past and future in terms of local food, economic empowerment, and a low environmental footprint. Talk is covered in food infrastructure, lighter, quicker, cheaper entrepreneurship, and place making. Um, I, I, these are, there are several issues here that, that I think have played a, a key role in, in the ability of San Antonio's economy to thrive and, and to continue to develop. Uh, as I mentioned, I'm an economics professor and I focus on urban, urban economies and, and spent a good number of years studying those. And, and uh, as I've studied and read and, and, and researched and sort of watched the evolution of economic development and its practices and how urban economies develop over the past 15 or so years, um, there's, there's certainly been a shift. Now, it's been the case for a long, long time, and I would argue for a couple hundred years at least, if not even longer than that, um, but at least the, the life of the, of the U.S., that entrepreneurship is what drives economies. Um, but you have to really go behind that and see what really drives entrepreneurial activity. And in San Antonio, historically, at least as, as I've observed, uh, a lot of that entrepreneurial activity, uh, at least on the technology side to some extent, has come out of our military bases. Um, we, we could, uh, I think I could make the case, for example, that I mean, none, none of us probably wanted to see any of the bases closed down, but when they closed uh, Kelly Air Force Base and it got converted to Port San Antonio, we actually saw quite a few companies as folks left, um, I keep wanting to call it Fort San Antonio, but Kelly Air Force Base and started their own technology companies and became very successful. So there was a lot of spin out of technology there. We see that interaction with the, the military bases and San Antonio being the home of military medicine and our medical center and the whole complex of military complex here and the interaction there. So it's, it's um, played a, a Important role in, in, our, in our entrepreneurial activity, um, and, and part of that activity, part of the part of the at least in the, the urban theory, and, and in my observations as well, is part of that entrepreneurial activity is driven by density. Uh, San Antonio, I think, in its past was far denser. Steve's going to talk about this, and, and may have some. Hopefully supports it. Uh, we may have some other thoughts on this as well. Uh, but I think in our past, we were, we, as a city, we were a lot denser. And like a lot of cities, especially cities in Texas, as the highway infrastructure was built out, uh, we continued to, to sprawl and sprawl and sprawl to, to where we are today. Um, but entrepreneurial activity thrives on the, the mixture of people and ideas, and this was serendipitous conversations that everybody has uh, what we would call localization and urbanization economies in the literature. And as, as San Antonio through its history is sort of sprawled, and again, this is not something that's unique to just San Antonio, I think we probably lost a little bit of that. So this sort of movement back into uh, the, the downtown core and, and and this effort, you heard a lot, a lot of the discussion at the lunch panels. Um, unfortunately, I wasn't able to make it for the morning, some of the morning sessions. I'm sure there were some discussions there about it. 
Uh, with this movement to more of a uh, live work play spaces, and they talked about in Pearl the, the, the um, uh, efforts that Grand Weston is making uh, downtown. Um, you know, Southtown is an area that I think just, just has, has, has grown up. Uh, a lot more uh, organically, if you will, than a lot of other areas of, of downtown. Um, but but these types of, of movements have, have are very important because they do bring the density back to the city. There's even pockets out in the suburbs. And you, <coughs> somebody might throw something at me for this, and and, and that's fine. I, I wouldn't necessarily agree, disagree with you, disagree with you. But things like the shops of Black Repair and and the rim, um, even down into Brook City base, and that, that aren't in the inner city core. They're, they're out of ways, but they're developing these pockets of, of live, work, play space. Um, I would prefer that they be in the, in the downtown area. I, I think, again, uh, the focus on that and, and, and the density we can build around that can only help in a lot of different ways, uh, particularly as with respect to entrepreneurial activity uh, and health and, and so on and so forth. But I, I think that's been, been an important transition. Some of those speakers uh, at lunch talked, talked about, and I think it was Mayor Taylor talked about the fact that, that it used to be the case that we would spend a lot of time in economic development trying to attract companies, and now it's the case we're trying to attract people. So again, coming back to this whole creating a quality of life, uh, the whole thing that, that uh, uh, um, Graham was talking about with the, the the software developer that he was trying to recruit. I've heard stories, and I'm sure many of you have, <laughs> along those same lines. Uh, so, so building a community that's able to attract and retain talent is going to be hugely important uh, to the future of, of our economic development. And if we're going to continue to develop as a community, as a city, as a metropolitan area, one of the two key things that I think come back to economic development, it's not the incentives that you talk about. I spent, I worked at the city of San Antonio for six and a half years in economic development as their chief economist. I spent a good amount of my time uh, working with companies trying to keep it, looking to come into San Antonio as well as developing the incentive programs. So I'm not against the city, the incentive programs. I think they're necessary. Um, but there, there's, there's been a shift away from we're always going to be trying to attract companies, but, but as I agree 100% with the mayor that we need to sort of have this shift towards creating more live, work, play spaces, places that are going to attract the millennials, um, and as well as, as others, uh, into a more dense space so we can get this milieu of, of ideas and interactions. And, and um, to me, that's going to be vitally important uh, to this. And, and what that is also going to drive one is it's, it's, I think it's going to improve education, not necessarily in a formal sense, but again, just those accidental conversations, if you will, uh, to, to give one very general example, but it drives health. And in my mind, if, if, if you don't have an educated labor force, and that labor force is not of good health, and you're going to those economies, it's going to be very difficult to develop. Um, so you talk about incentives and all these other things that go on, but really, to me, in my mind, it comes back those sort of two key factors. Uh, so again, to me, that the, the built environment then becomes extremely important to me, not only in its ability to attract and retain labor, but in its ability, as many, many studies have shown, for it to maintain, or to help improve and maintain the health of the workforce. Um, we do, I was, I, was, I was driving home yesterday, and, and uh, David Clear, was on NPR, TPR radio, and David Martin Davies show, and they were talking about the conference and livability and all that stuff. And, and there were actually a couple of people called in from Seattle, and one of them was here, and they were had been to San Antonio, and then they generalized very quickly, but they had talked about the difficulties of getting around San Antonio and, and some of the things that Seattle had done. Um, and, and one of them who mentioned, I'm not coming back. Um, so that's the kind of struggle that, that we're going to have. I think we've made huge strides in that area. Uh, they mentioned it once again in the Pearl area, and I just bring that up because I wanted to talk a little bit about the, the 
the local food and, and the, the importance of, of local food production and that type of thing, uh, not only from a health perspective, uh, but I think in my mind, uh, not only the development of Pearl, but bringing the culinarians to American Pearl in combination with the culinary school of St. Phillips and um, the other culinary schools around the community have played a huge role in sort of putting San Antonio on the food map, if you will. Uh, and and I, I think that's, that's been a, I, we moved down here in 1998, just in that time period, I've seen a huge change in, in the food culture in San Antonio. Um, we, uh, um, when I came down here from the bank, we got out of Dallas and came down here, Dallas at the time had a massive farmer's market, just huge. One of the sort of frustrations we had down here, is there were any, there were very few, if any, farmers markets around here. Now there's a proliferation of them everywhere. Uh, we're starting to see some community gardens that I know Jeff's going to talk about. But this all sort of feeds into that community, that sort of healthy community, that sort of uh, ability to attract and, and retain labor, especially the millennial generation and the, the importance of that. I was at another conference this morning, I gave a talk there. And, and the folks were, um, it, was, it was a bunch of furniture, furniture manufacturers group and some of the retailers and that. And they spent a lot of time after my conversation talking about how the changes and shifts were, they were having to make to, to, um, uh, to, to be able to, to attract the millennials into their store, get them to buy their products and, and so on and so forth. And um, it's, it's just a different, they, they think differently, they, they, looking for quality of life and that type of thing. But that's the, the future of, of our economy. And, and so we need to be able to have a community that can, retract, that can attract and retain them. So I think going forward, I didn't touch a lot on, on transportation and the infrastructure, but a lot of this, you know, if we're building these live, work, play communities, a lot of that is around the infrastructure. First thing I think the transportation infrastructure is huge. Going forward, it's going to be one of the key things that, that we have to continue to develop. And when I say transportation infrastructure, I mean a broad variety of transportation. I'm not necessarily, I'm not talking about just roads, I'm talking about lightens, infrastructure, walking infrastructure, and the whole host. And then, then you know, that, to my mind, leads to more density. And I think that's an, a key piece of San Antonio's ability to, to grow and develop. Um, for the reasons that hopefully I've talked about a little bit. So I'm going to shut it off there with my rambling, um, and hopefully I've, I've set it up a little bit for, for Steve and Jeff. Let me introduce them, and then, and then I'll, I'll turn it over. Uh, Steve Land Tillerson, right here to my left, is an architect and partner at Munoz & Company, engages in cultural phenomena with revelatory nature, a place and design of new architecture, historic preservation and site-sensitive planning. He has produced a variety of award-winning civic and institutional projects throughout Texas and is an ardent investigator of San Antonio's urban process. And I work with Steve on his projects and I can surely attest to that. You're going to enjoy what he has to say. He has been an advocate for sustainable and contact-sensitive development and community revitalization in South Texas for over three decades and he is currently engaged in the restoration of San Pedro Creek to reimagine the one and a half mile drainage ditch as a linear urban park. And I was fortunate enough to do the economic impact study on that. I can't wait to see what you guys come up with and to see that implemented. It's going to be a huge boost to the downtown area. Uh, Jeff Crane, to the, to the left of Steve here, I grew up in Washington State uh, and earned his PhD in history at Washington State University. His scholarship is focused on river development, protest against dams, impacts on salmon and other fisheries, and river restoration efforts. Currently, his work is focused more on urban farming, greening the cities, and climate change. He is the Associate Dean of the College of Humanities, Arts, and Social Sciences at the University of the Incarnate Word and serves on the board of Green Spaces Alliance. He's published three books, which is quite remarkable in my opinion. One, the environmental, the environment in American history: essays on the history of American environmentalism, finding the river. And I'm, and I'm getting all this all messed up. Sorry, Jeff. The second one is finding the river: an environmental history of the Elwha. Am I saying that right? 
and the environment in American history, nature, and the formation of the United States. He is currently editing with Char Miller an edited collection titled The Politics of Hope, Grassroots Organizing, Environmental Justice, and Social Change, to be published by the University of Colorado Press in like 2016, early 2017. Obviously a very busy gentleman. Um, so with that, Steve, let me turn it over to you, and then we'll, we'll go to Jeff, and then we'll take some questions. Thank you. Well, thank you for that introduction, and uh, I, uh, it's a pleasure to be here today. I spoke at uh, last year's conference, and uh, it was the first time that uh, I had began to really think about the environment, uh, the relationship of the environment to health. Uh, really, my, my view is, is a fairly a focused view on, on some historic aspects of how we've built in the past and how the phenomenon of health has uh, really been affected or influenced by that. And looking uh, from that, uh, taking some ideas and kind of, uh, kind of patterns that uh, existed in the past and looking at uh, how that might uh, apply in the future. And looking at San Antonio way that I think some people uh, kind of forget to, to look at. So, um, and, and anybody find it really easy to drive around and get around San Antonio to know where you are? Is it kind of really easy or is it kind of difficult? Like the streets are crooked and you don't know where you are and everything like that. Well, um, what you're looking at is really a, um, a map of San Antonio I did some years ago. And it was really to identify the provenance of all the street geometries in the city. And uh, the area kind of around the river is really a Kirby in downtown and you kind of twist around and there's no numbers and there's no, you know, letters. It's just all names. Um, but once you get outside of that, there's a fairly regular grid that was established, and you see that in that uh, kind of the larger colors. And then when you get into the suburban parts, it starts to get all wiggly again, and you get lost. So, um, but the lesson from this really was my interest in understanding what the how the the city grew, because nobody grew, uh, builds streets uh, kind of uh, uh, without thinking about them. Uh, the kind of the old story about. Uh, San Antonio's roads were laid out by, uh, you know, cows and, uh, you know, drunk herders and things like that. It really doesn't apply. It was actually very deliberate and very well engineered. Um, and if we understood that, then we might get around a little bit easier. Um, San Antonio was laid out according to a plan. There's a planning document for all of the towns of the New Spain uh, that really goes back to uh, the, the 1500s. And his planning precepts were really to deal with um, regulations for water, for arable land, uh, had, settlements had to have dependable food and water supplies, uh, building shelter and town planning and governance. There's a lot of governance, um, but there's a considerable amount of town planning. And those helped uh, be the, those were actually the planning guidelines for that time period. Uh, the form, the image that you see here, uh, again, it's, it's San Antonio, but reconstructed to the time of about 1800 or so, the early 19th century. And what, let me see if I can move an arrow here. No. Uh, what you see in the dark green really are the cultivated fields uh, really lining uh, either side of the San Antonio River Basin from Brackenridge Park all the way down to Espada. And there were about seven to eight exequia systems that really uh, um, <clears throat> uh, supported these, uh, these fields, these porcions. And the, the exequia systems, the irrigation water, was essential because this is a place of really marginal rainfall. So if you're going to have any kind of dependable local food supply, you have to have a relatively dependable supply of water. And the, uh, the Spanish uh, engineers and the, uh, the, the priests were very well trained in the construction of acequias and with very rudimentary tools produced um, over about 35 miles of, uh, of, of ditches that are precisely a 0.3% gradient. Uh, they're just remarkable. Uh, so a lot of the, the kind of the, the road system followed those old acequias, followed the porciones, and essentially developed uh, a, a pattern uh, of land tenure that was agriculturally based, um, but really centers along the creek, uh, along the creeks and along the river. Uh, what you see in the 
the light green is actually the Ejidos. Uh, those were, that was the, uh, the eight league grant, um, which was about 67 square miles. And that was essentially the, the public lands. And those could not be developed. Uh, they were held for public uh, uh, development and that had to be regulated um, through, the, uh, th through the authority. And in this case, the authority was uh, in, in Mexico City. So development was really had, was constrained to some degree by a lot of bureaucracy and red tape on that. So people had to be resourceful within limited means. Now, if you focus a little bit closer, this is actually the downtown area. I'd like to go back to this one. Uh, you see the little brown area where it seems like uh, there's a spider web and that that's the center of it. That's the actual settlement town itself. And really what this is, is a, a cultural landscape. It's not just a natural realm, but it's how people have amended it and changed it. And when you look at the focus area in the, in the downtown area, you'll see the, the San Antonio River uh, really on the right-hand side, the familiar bend of the river uh, that is downtown. Uh, you'll see uh, the Alamo is to the, about the right center that really formed the nucleus Mission San Antonio at the time. The civil settlement was on the other side of the river between San Pedro Creek and San Antonio River. And you'll see the main and military plaza there where the Presidio uh, was first established. And really the town essentially started as that core and it grew out to the north, uh, east, south, and west in different uh, small initial suburbs. Uh, that uh, uh, from about 1730 to uh, 1800. And this really represents really the kind of the peak of the Spanish colonial era. Uh, all of the green striped areas and, and uh, that you see to the north, uh, all around the city, those are the porciones, those are the fields that were cultivated, uh, there were orchards, there were pastures, there were grow crops, there were gardens, there were basically all the foodstuffs that could be grown to, to support the community. And you see they kind of have an outline, uh, you'll see a little kind of a lighter blue line, and that was the Asakia system. It's very skillfully engineered and very uh, um, uh, very well regulated. Uh, what, what you need to understand about the, 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 the Asakias is that um, they were really a, totally a community effort. Um, and living in that area, uh, one square mile, there was about 2,500 people, about 1810. So if you look at the density, you have about 2,500 people in one square mile. I mentioned the Asakias, and I just wanted to show you a, an image. Uh, they're, they're not grand uh, Roman aqueducts by any means, although there they were some really nice structures. Of course, the Espada Aqueduct is uh, one of those. But they were not just for delivering irrigation water. They were, a, they were a domestic water supply. They also supplied water for industrial uses, and, and they were totally essential. The word of safety comes from an Arabic word, sekia, which is waterway. And um, water was precious in North Africa and Southern Spain, and it was viewed as very precious here. I want to zoom in even a little bit closer. Um, this would be about that same time. And at that point, San Antonio was Via de San Fernando. It uh, had the Presidio that you see in kind of the square on the left-hand side, closer to the, the San Pedro Creek. Uh, the church and the uh, main plaza, the Plaza de las Islas, for the Canary Islanders to settle. And within that area, uh, there were townhouses um, that had uh, gardens and yards and support areas. There were workshops, there were uh, service yards. And you had people living in those, uh, those houses that were uh, uh, for domestic uh, living, and then they were uh, running their businesses out of them. But you also had people living there that had land on the outskirts of town. So a lot of the portions that you see were not occupied. They were simply farmed and, uh, and, and utilized by uh, people living in town. And then you had people actually living more on the outskirts of town itself. Mm -hmm. So the very fine grain of people living, walking to their work, close by, having lots of open space, although it was in production and cultivation uh, most of the time, is fairly well represented in this image. And when you think about um, kind of a model, 
if you will. This, uh, again, reminds you this is a density of about 2,500 living in a place that is essentially um, um, in the middle of a series of gardens. I'd like to go back one more time to this uh, slide and just to, to tell a story too. About a generation after the founding of San Antonio in 1731, uh, they had built up the Asequia systems for about 20 years, and they began to suffer from erosion. Um, and it was really a crisis for them because they could not hold the water in the Asequias, they could not get clean water, it was uh, contaminated from runoff uh, stormwater. And they realized that all the wood that they, the trees that they had been cutting down for the wood to fuel the fires, to build the houses, to build the fences, to do everything they needed, they had completely denuded the landscape around them. The trees could not hold the soil anymore. Every time it rained, it just caught us. It, uh, the runoff, the silty runoff would uh, uh, tear into the uh, sacreds. So the first piece of environmental legislation actually in San Antonio was in the 1750s. And it was uh, declared that they had to repair all the acequias, uh, that they had to plant trees along all the creeks and rivers, stabilize the banks, and you could not cut wood down for a full league with the, uh, uh, around the city. That's two and a half miles. So that was a huge sacrifice for that community of about a thousand people that said um, at that point, that um, you had to go further, you had to spend more energy, work harder, and get risk getting scalped just to cut wood because you had to protect the water. And I think that's a really interesting indication of what a community has to do to commit themselves to maintaining their environment. By the 1850s, of course, um, the, the entire cultural context had changed. It was no longer a dominant Hispanic culture, there was really a dominant Anglo culture. The hedos of the large, uh, the public lands were actually sold off, and the city limits were defined as a six square mile area, or six miles by six miles, actually a 36 mile square area that was centered at the dome of the San Fernando Cathedral. And if you look at that one square mile, by 1910, the population was about 100,000. So the density was about 2,750 square mile. By 1910, there was pipe water system, there was sanitary sewer, there was a streetcar system, there was electric lighting and power. So it was a relatively sophisticated infrastructure. Um, it, had, um, it, had, it was plugged in with the national uh, rail grid. It had regional uh, uh, commercial and passenger rail. And so it was a fairly thriving city in this 36 square miles not too much more dense than how it was uh, almost 100 years before. By 1940, the population had more than doubled. 254,000 people in the same 36 square miles, density of 7,000, more than 7,000. And how that was achieved was in little baby houses around the outskirts and in higher rise uh, walk up three, four-story apartment buildings. And this is the elevation of the skyline of San Antonio from 1910 to 1940. This is where you got all the early, the pre-World War II skyscrapers that you see today. So density went up, and it did not, the city did not grow out of its limits. It simply grew within it and accommodated it. And so to, just to summarize the growth of the city, um, really looking at from the, just the density figures, 2,500 per square mile um, in 1800. Uh, a century later, 2,775 <coughs> people per square mile. In 1940, just pre-World War II, 7,000 uh, square mile. And now, our density is about 3,000 square mile. So of our 1.4 odd million population, uh, an area of 467 miles, um, we really have dropped back on density. And for two reasons. Of course, the expansion of the city uh, limits from 36 square miles to the 467 that we have today, but also the de 
densification of San Antonio's already developed urban areas. And that was largely a, the result of model cities and urban renewal and things like that that was some, uh, uh, designed as uh, or implemented as some slum clearance. But one of the fatal flaws of the economics of our city has been rebuilding areas already settled at lower densities. And when you think about what density really means, is we have a population now, uh, our, our, our density is about 3,000. If we compare that to Dallas and Houston, um, they have a higher density. Uh, more people, same amount of infrastructure. So it's more affordable to the population for public infrastructure. 